Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let me try one more time. I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me, but that you're not deafened by me. Um, Anthony, is it good? Is it okay? Up, down? Good, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm really blown away. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as you know, or maybe you don't know, but I, I read from um, a, a, a script, I suppose. Um, that's my format. So um, thank you so much for coming, and I have something to read to you. Um, I've invited myself here today to talk to you about how the 24-7 surveillance via high-resolution facial recognition IP cameras that will be affixed to your LED street light poles are going to work in conjunction with the loss of cash and the imposition of a central bank digital currency like the Scott coin, a leaflet for which you can find on your chair, um, to totally destroy your interactional and transactional privacy, uh, side hustle no more, uh, which you have my permission to take as a not entirely oblique obituary to the black market. And I'm just going to wait a few more moments and let these lovely people come in. There we go. Hi. Um, so, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, I have actually paid for me to be standing here, which I'm only telling you as being indicative of my authenticity and concern. What you extrapolate regarding my sanity is entirely your own affair. Um, and Govan has earned the dubious honor of being my first port of call on this self-imposed imposition of self, because this is where Glasgow was built, and this is where I wanted to start my efforts to make sure that the people of Glasgow don't go down. Um, and if you're listening to this on the recording and you're unfamiliar with the history of Glasgow, then Govan, where I am today, was the heart of the shipbuilding industry, which is what put Glasgow on the map. Um, the people of Govan suffered enormously when that industry was ripped out of their community, never to be commensurately replaced. And it's my contention, but more importantly my concern, that it's the people of Govan and the other people of so-called socio-economically deprived of their industry areas that will suffer from uh, the most from this covert global effort to outsmart the population. Uh, smart being the operative word, and if you haven't already noticed it and you start listening out for it, you will hear it everywhere. Smart cities, smart streetlights, smart meters, smart phones, smart Fitbits, and even smart toilets, I kid you not. Um, and just because you quite reasonably may think that I'm talking shy, shy of the truth, there is a leaflet on your chair for Washloo, the UK's sole domestic luxury smart toilet toilet, which you can dispose of at your leisure. Um, and I'm here to ask you whether uh, to consider whether this overt and repetitive use of the word smart might be evidence that the, there is a smart, or, sorry, smart aleck ploy afoot to appeal to everyone's association with the word smart as being a benign force for the positive, when um, in fact, as we all know in Scotland, multiple positives can actually make a negative. I write, says I, to your smart. Um, the last time that I spoke, it was in Edinburgh, and I was invited that time. So technically, they could have asked me to leave, whereas you lovely people don't have that option. Um, and my big takeaway from that talk was that I had to try and talk more, which, for the people who know me, understands presents something of a challenge. One does have to breathe, after all. Um, but what I mean is that we all have to talk more. And we have to talk to people that don't already know, to people that we might be scared will disagree with us, and even, as I'm doing so today, to people that we've never even met before. 
Um, we're at a pivotal juncture in history where artificial intelligence-driven algorithms are being used as a means to inform and shape human and social behavior. And human and social behavior is being used as a means to inform artificial intelligence-driven algorithms. And this highly volatile feedback loop is being simultaneously exploited both to extract capital gain and to construct a digital prison from which humanity as we currently understand it can never escape. Which is why I'm here and which is why I imagine that you are here, um, not just because you love to hear about LED street lighting. Um, that being said, more fool all of us if we fail to recognize how far the lowly streetlight has come in the race to evolve beyond all transhuman comprehension. And if we don't explain to one another how this most innocuous of Mataharis is going to play its part in a technocratic system which will see all of nature's most beautiful and priceless assets from every drop of water to every grain of sand and soil, given a value and apportioned out using a tokenized digital credit, credit system, the integrity and necessity of which will be sold to us using a philosophical justification called communitarianism, which can be simply put as a means of decision making such that the needs of the individual are always put secondary to the perceived needs of the greater good. So, first, infrastructure, for which I can only apologize. It's probably just as well that I didn't know that my childhood dreams of making the world a better place would amount to oration on the subject of street lighting, LED or otherwise, or I might not have made it this far. Second, technocracy, back once again with the renegade master, power to the people, or um, in this case, not, as the case is at the moment, power only to those who redeem their tokenized electricity credits or accept smart top-ups in lieu of the cash to budget with as they see fit. And finally, communitarianism, which you have my permission to think of in terms of a call center. In fact, the whole thing can be quite neatly metaphorized by a comparison to one of these bastions of travesty, in the sense that all data was used in order to establish the five options from Dante's call center hell. Um, that's an example of human behavior informing artificial intelligence. And then your choices being marginalized by those available options is an example of artificial intelligence informing human behavior. And we all know the warm, fuzzy feeling that interacting with a call center has gifted mankind. Um, <laughs> the justification for which has always been the principle of communitarianism, that operating this way makes transacting quicker and more efficient for the greater number of people, the greater good thereby trumping the needs of the individual. So welcome to technocracy, a world in which everyone you meet behaves as though their life and everything in it has been compartmentalized according to best call center practice. And there you have the solution to any would-be overpopulation problem because either everyone kills each other or they kill themselves. Um, only no, that won't work because the new economy is going to be based on data. So we need to be miserable, but just not quite miserable enough to stop playing the game which is much like a call center too, the metaphor that just keeps on giving. Everyone knows it's a terrible idea, but because providers per persist with the service, we think that maybe we're in the minority, or perhaps we're just being selfish, or let's face it, we're a bit too mired in the perceived benefits of some other aspect of what the institution offers. For whatever reason, we don't walk with our feet, and we find, and find human-only alternatives. And the problem is that window in which we can walk with our feet, that thing we call choice, if we don't use it now, it's going to be a thing of the past. So on that cheery note, let's talk about street lights. Um, uh, and at this point, if you have heard me talk about street lighting before, please feel free to choose option one and tune out entirely for about three minutes because in line with the World Economic Forum playbook for a globally sustainable Temera, I am committed to some degree of recycling old material. 
Um, in fact, when a change agent, which is, in my opinion, a far inferior, inferior update on the term agent provocateur, approached me after my last talk and said to me, you don't want to have to go around giving this same talk to people over and over again, do you? I knew that I had to go around giving this same talk to people over and over again. Mm -hmm. Good news, however, if you have heard it all before regarding our all-seeing, all-hearing, omnipresent, soon to be omnipotent, friends, uh, LED streetlights, please hang on in there for the pièce de résistance, where I'm going to take you to their leader, well, their Glasgow leader, the Glasgow Future City Operations Centre. And what's a little repetition in the face of a VIP tour aboard, on board Glasgow's stealth command satellite of the WEF mothership? So, street lighting no less. Sold to us all on the basis that blue light is so much better for the human eye than white light. No, sorry, that's a complete lie. Really, it isn't. Sold to us on the basis that LED lighting takes less electricity to power than traditional filament lighting. Leaving out the bit about how, and I'm quoting from a lighting pole manufacturer's business to business sales pitch now, the raised sources of light have a support structure and a supply of electrical power, make, making street lighting networks a readily available, geographically advantageous platform to deploy Internet of Things devices. The powering of which devices, including high-resolution facial recognition-enabled IP cameras, will presumably more than make up for any deficit in overall electrical bulb powering usage. So, where are these street lights? Well, if you haven't noticed them before, please don't worry. You can introduce yourself to the ones right outside this very building uh, when you leave. And then, if you so desire, you can meet and greet them all the way home. Because they are all located, for your better acquaintance, within about a 30 meter radius of each other. I learned about them by reading from the aforementioned online business-to-business -business sales pitch written by a lighting pole manufacturer, the imposition on my time for which I intend to make them uh, thoroughly regret. It was prefixed thus, a, a smart street light is an intelligent outdoor lighting system that is context aware to its environment and is wirelessly networked to support interoperability and sophisticated user interaction in the Internet of Things ecosystem. <laughs> Fun, isn't it? Um, to break it down, a smart street lighting is an intelligent, so read artificial intelligence, which means that it collects data and uses that data to inform the, it, the way that it operates in future, and also likely for better return on investment, sells that data to the highest bidder and every bidder thereafter. So, it's a data collecting and processing outdoor lighting system that is context aware to its environment, where you are part of its environment. So, it's a data collecting and processing outdoor lighting system that is, that is, monitoring, that is monitoring you and wirelessly networked to support interoperability and sophisticated user interaction in the Internet of Things ecosystem. So, what is the Internet of Things? Why is it so unimaginatively named? Actually, I never got the answer to that, I don't know. And can it really be said to have an ecosystem? Or would that be a thinly veiled attempt to have you associate these privacy invading monstrosities with all that is natural and fundamental in this world? The lighting manual goes on. The Internet of Things bridges the gap between the physical and digital world through the use of smart devices that can collect or transmit information. The Internet of Things is not a single technology. It is a convergence of sensors, devices, networks, and software that synergistically work to extract knowledge and actionable insights and turn them into real-world return on investment because who cares about privacy when there's a profit to be made? Sorry, that's not in the script. Let's continue. With the Internet of Things, real world objects are connected to the internet and interact with each other, mobile and web applications. In doing so, these connected things become smart devices that can create, communicate, aggregate, analyze, or act on information. 
LED street lighting is poised to play a major role in the Internet of Things. And we're almost finished here. You're doing great. This is the bit that I mentioned before about all the savings to be made powering every sensor under the sun and moon. Street lights have a ubiquitous presence in urban areas, located every 30 to 80 feet along almost every road or street. The raised sources of light have a support structure and a supply of electrical power. These features make street lighting networks a readily available, geographically advantageous platform to deploy Internet of Things devices. In addition to implementing the enabling of sophisticated lighting strategies and delivering further energy savings, Internet of Things enabled street lighting creates a backbone network that supports a range of smart city applications. So, an exciting November Sunday afternoon in sunny Govan with Temera Yule reading a street lighting manufacturer's sales pitch to your local council because they did pitch it to your local council, and your local council bought it, and they bought the LED lighting too, with a handy grant from the World Economic Forum, and then your local council, and my local council, and our local councils had them installed all over our precious Bonnie Scotland. And did you note the mention of smart cities right at the end there? Well, I hope you will be indignant at the very least to know, if you didn't know already, that every city in Scotland is signed up to be a smart city. So Aberdeen, Perth, Inverness, Edinburgh, Dundee, Stirling, and Glasgow, all of them. This decision to sign away the individuality, the unique qualities which make every city the same, but very and essentially different, was taken in 2013 by the Scottish Cities Alliance Leadership Group, who agreed to develop a collaborative program around smart cities as part of its strategic implementation plan. By reading through all of the planning reports and articles that I can find, and in particular the Smart Cities Blueprint, my big takeaways are thus. The idea is to homogenize cities, not just cities in close proximity, not just cities within one state or nation, but all cities everywhere. The explanation goes something like this. We, the WEF, who are promoting and sponsoring the phenomenon of smart cities through the World Economic Forum G20 Smart Cities Alliance, have determined the, the, the definition of best practice for all things urban planning. So if you all apply our guidance and grants, uh, sorry, if you all apply for our guidance and grants, not only will you have maximum smart cityization for minimum disruption, but every single city in the world will operate on an interchangeable, data-driven, biometric basis. And well, won't that be fun and probably sustainable? Um, so what would that mean for, let's say, Glasgow? Well, actually, who cares about it being Glasgow, since they'll all be exactly the same. But given that Glasgow was declared a world leader in smart city innovation by the UK government back in 2017, let's pay homage where homage is apparently due. Being a forerunner in the race to find out where humanity ends and techno-transhumanism begins means that Glasgow has its own website, futurecity.glasgow.gov.uk which I can't access on my laptop because of, and I think this is really funny, uh, privacy error. Um, <laughs> so what you're saying is that I can't read your website about how you're planning to invade my privacy because you're worried about my privacy. But happily, by some quirk of completely foolproof futuristic innovation, I can get in onto it using my phone. So if you look on your seat, you should be able to find two handouts where in decrepit but effective old school styly, I have screenshotted the content, cut and pasted it onto Word and printed it out for you to take a look at um, and share with your friends. And then I discovered that the privacy of a very good friend of mine is not such, a, a, not such deep concern to the establishment. And that friend has been kind enough to lend me their laptop. So if you're watching on the recording, you should be able to see this on the screen. Um, let's take a look at the LED street lighting one first. 
just to prove to you that I'm not a rocket, which is Glasgow slang for wired to a Mars bar, which is Glasgow slang for nice but not entirely sane. So in this one, future city, oh, bear with us, two seconds, it's coming. Thank you so much. Right, down there, that's it. Thank you, one, and oh, this one, and here, and over here. There we go, guys, intelligent street lighting. Um, and I'm just going to read it for you uh, for the benefit of anybody watching the recording, but also because I think it's important. So this is futurecityglasgow.gov.uk. Um, Intelligent street lighting, smart lighting for a smart city. <laughs> street lights are a vital part of every city, providing citizens with safety and security. But what if we could use our street lighting network in a more intelligent way, rather than the simple on-off system that currently exists? As a complete aside, by the way, that's a sentence that starts with but and a question that ends without a question mark. So apparently what we gain in intelligent street lighting, we lose in intelligible grammar. But anyway. <laughs> Through our Future Cities demonstrator, Glasgow is leading the way with the trial of intelligent street lighting, looking at ways to add more control and efficiency to our lighting network, while harnessing the power of real-time data to improve both lighting and safety throughout the city. So, why intelligent lighting? I just want you to be able to see they've got really fun icons for everybody, yeah? So it's going to say, why intelligent lighting? The introduction of intelligent lighting offers several key benefits to a city, including environmental, financial, safety, and security. So it's energy efficient, um, and I'm going to go back to this because there might even be one or two little funny asides in there, possibly if I can find my place. Um, uh, LED lighting reduces your carbon footprint and long-term operation costs, the savings of which can then be spent on surveillance. Um, and then operations center integration. Real-time data feeds directly into the state-of-the-art operations center, allowing for the manual brightening and of, of lighting when required. Hmm, I wonder whether the manual brightening of street lighting is the only reason that we have developed a state-of-the-art operations center. Noise detection. Street disturbances can be monitored using noise detection with real-time CCTV and community safety response. Movement detection. Movement sensors allow us to monitor footfall and traffic flow, generating important data to aid in city planning. This is an oblique reference to the planned 20-minute neighborhoods, where future generations will be what is called geofenced within certain boundaries. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Air pollution detection. Air pollution monitoring can be integrated into the street lighting network, giving the city up-to-date and accurate data to help with planning and pollution reduction. So you've got to think geofencing again and um, carbon credits, and we'll talk about that in a minute or two as well. And then Wi-Fi service. An intelligent street lighting network allows for the provision of a limited Wi-Fi service for use by vital city services and citizens. And that's about geo fencing your online access via optical and brain frying 5G. Um, so there's lots to digest, but for want of time, let's just go for the big one, which is Glasgow Operations Centre. Um, well, uh, what is Glasgow Operations Centre? Um, well, Glasgow Operations Centre, about which most Glasgow residents know absolutely nothing, is apparently the beating heart of our city. The Glasgow Operations Centre is a state-of-the-art integrated traffic and public safety management system created with the aid of Innovate UK funding. The new centre brings together public space CCTV, security for the City Council's museums and art galleries, traffic management and police intelligence. 
the facility has the capability to provide a coordinated, real-time, intelligence-led response to incidents large and small across the city, placing Glasgow at the leading edge of smart city management. V uh, video analytics is a pivotal tool used as an additional intelligence source. This emerging technology provides operations center operators with alerts as situations and events unfold, resulting in improved, more informed decision making, earlier intervention and reaction to events. Promoting a safer and sustainable environment, intelligence from the operations centre will be managed and mapped to monitor and measure a range of indicators showing its impact and value on behalf of Glasgow residents, businesses, visitors and stakeholders. And that's about data collection and we'll talk about that again in a moment. So what is the operations centre? Now, if you go down here... Yes, indeed, what are you, Operation Centre? And apparently, the video is private. So, despite it being the beating heart of our city, you may not look at whatever it is. And then bringing it all together, just so that you believe me, that is also private. You may not see that either. Um, so then, but we'll go down to this bit, because this bit's really good, okay? Um, this is a bit where uh, they explain to you that um, there's going to be central citywide CCTV monitoring with upgrade to full HD cameras. So what, uh, what you're to think is that there's a sort of city centre CCTV monitoring because of the way it's written, central citywide CCTV, um, which people might find slightly less objectionable. But what it means is centrally monitored citywide CCTV with upgrade to HD. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, I've lost where it says it. But um, anyway, it says somewhere that they go oh, for upgrade to full HD cameras. I lost my confidence. I thought, is it an HD camera or is it an H some other letter camera? It's an HD camera. Okay, so traffic management then. Um, upgraded systems for traffic monitoring and signal control across the city. Police Scotland. Intelligent working with key partners with ease of access to CCTV footage. Okay, I think that's really worth dwelling upon. Who are the key partners? Um, why do they get to see everything? And what does that mean for everybody and for their children? Yeah? Um, security services. Secure sharing of data for the effective and intelligent management of security-related incidents. Um, this one freaks me out totally. Can you see it? Community enforcement. I mean, what even is that? But there you go. Intelligence-led strategic tactical patrols. <sighs> yeah. It's annoying, isn't it? Well, I mean, that's to understate, but we are on camera. Um, Intelligence-led strategic tactical patrols resulting apparently in a cleaner, safer, and more sustainable Glasgow. And that word sustainable, this is not in the script, really, really annoys me. You'll see it everywhere. They just throw it in. It doesn't even, it, it, sometimes it doesn't even make any sense. You know, the thing couldn't possibly be sustainable. But anyway, you can look out for it yourselves now. And emergency services, collaborative partnership working resulting in joint decision making and proactive informed response to incidents. So there you have it. It sounds to me like Barlini without the bars. Um, and if you're watching on the recording, Barlini is, is an institution of some note in Scotland where we detain those who have fallen short, shall we say, of other people's right to privacy. Um, but don't worry, your Barlini barcode, or should I say QR code, aka digital ID, this is annoying, isn't it, the page turning? It's all right. I'll refine this for next time. I'm new, newbie, rookie. Here we go. Um, so let's, that's, uh, let's just be in the right place. Okay. So just because it lost something there. Um, but don't worry, your Barlini barcode, or should I say QR code, a.k.a. digital ID, 
will no doubt get you in and out of your stack and pack housing and enable you to access your 20 minute neighborhood with all the facilities that you could possibly desire to re reside on your own doorstep for time immemorial. Working and living from home, never to burden the world with your wanderlust any further than a day trip to the geofence boundary in a self-drive uh, automated vehicle, which will come at minimal cost to your generous allotment of carbon credits. Handily, the Scottish Government hosted an online meeting just this past Wednesday to update people on the progress um, of the, the system as they prepare to go live with Scotland's digital identity programme. So that's good to know, isn't it? Um, I attended and it was, as you would expect, presented as being entirely benign um, an optional extra that the Scottish Government has spent millions of pounds worth of public money developing so that the public can choose not to use it should they see fit. And I'll leave it you know, up to you to decide whether you think that it will remain um, voluntary. Um, so, we've covered LED streetlights, smart cities, and digital ID, which just leaves me a couple of minutes for digital currency, blockchain, and social impact investing. The idea with digital currency is to phase out cash, the fiat currency. Because put very simply, governments all over the Western world have printed more paper money than they could ever possibly pay back. So they need to crash the system in order to pull off the biggest hoist in history. Having done this, they will then be in a position to hold you accountable for every transaction that you ever make by means of blockchain, a database designed to store information in immutable chunks. Some synonyms for immutable are irreversible, permanent, and inalterable. And of course, because there will no longer be any cash, you will never be able to make a transaction in private again, ever and nor will your children, ever. What happened to the grace, you know, of mistake making? This is a really, really bad idea. Moreover, money, which by virtue of no longer having the virtue of any basis in reality, can then be tokenized, as we're seeing in Britain right now with our electricity allotments, so that your digital currency can only be spent on that which it is designated for. And it can also be set to expire if it's not spent within a predefined period of time. So in this country at the moment, if you have a, uh, if you've resisted smart meters and you still pay as you go for your electricity, you'll be in receipt of monthly installments of 66 pounds worth of electricity, which is worthless if it's not redeemed within three months of issue, and is also worthless if you would rather be even more energy efficient and buy a jumper instead of turning up the heating. Um, digital currency and blockchain can also be combined to limit your usage of a given resource, for instance, water or carbon, but also um, tobacco, alcohol or red meat. So if for argument's sake you were bloody minded enough to prefer a steak to compressed bug po protein, um, then you may not have enough carbon credits left that week to make it to the geofence border in your publicly owned and shared self-drive automated car for your big day out to the edge of your 20 minute neighborhood. Um, I know it all sounds banzai, doesn't it? Um, but back in 2021, Christopher Snowden of the Institute for Economic Affairs warned that the British government could only achieve its climate change targets by forcing people to eat uh, less red meat. Um, he made the comments during an appearance on GB News after a leaked report by the National Food Strategy, which encouraged people to consume edible algae and fermented protein alternatives such as microbes and plant biomass. I also think that unless you've come across it before, you will probably, uh, it will probably be quite hard for you to believe the 20 minute neighborhood chat, um, which is why you'll find a printout on your chair from the Glasgow City Council web, uh, website entitled Livable Neighborhoods. And I've forgotten to put that up, but I'm gonna put it up now because it's worth seeing, okay? You hold the microphone, baby. Thank you. I speak truth. Good. Thank 
with that really, really, really well. Thank you, Indiana. Um, so, I also think that unless you've come across it before, it will probably be quite hard for you to believe the 20 minute neighborhood chat, which is um, why we're now looking at this here. So, have a, we'll have a wee read of it. Um, uh, Glasgow's approach to, and I'm quoting now, blending the 20 minute neighborhood concept with the place principle. The City Council will work with and enable communities to improve their areas through the formation of livable neighbourhood plans. This process was initiated in summer 2021 with the publication of the Livable Neighbourhood Toolkit. Through six tranches of work, livable neighbourhood plans will cover every area of Glasgow. And you will no doubt be delighted to know that Govan is in the first tranche, which covers Greater Govan, Ibrox and Kingston. And it really is intended that you guys will have no need and ultimately no option to go any further than Greater Govan, Ibrox and Kingston. Uh, good luck if you're a Rangers fan and nay luck if you support Celtic, eh? Okay? Um, so, the last thing to cover is social impact investing which is basically how the money hoarding maniacs who conceptualize this technocratic tyranny intend to remove what very few basic liberties that you have remaining through public-private partnerships, which is essentially just psychopaths, sorry, philanthropists. It's a hard word to say, you know, easy mistake to make. Um, after all, if you can hoard money on a monumental scale, knowing that the way our systems work at the moment, you are hoarding a life-giving resource that could feed hungry children. And instead of feeding hungry children, you philanthropically invest in emotionally and socially governing other people. That's what they call it, by the way, emotional and social governance. So anyway, if instead of feeding hungry children in your great ironic benevolence, uh, you decide to emotionally and socially govern other people such that they can't hoard resources themselves, Hmm, philanthropist, psychopath, are they new speak synonyms? I'll leave it up to you to decide. Anyway, these philanthropists invest in or offer funding to public projects so that public projects become beholden to their funders and then their funders get a disproportionate say in how they shape their communities. Fait accompli. It's done. So, I know that's a lot to digest, um, and really I've just skimmed the, the very murky surface of a festering swamp, but I want to leave you with a couple of things that you can do about all of this. Um, firstly, you can talk to other people. Talk to your friends, talk to your communities, and in particular, talk to or email your councillors and MPs. I'm not saying get embroiled in your community council, um, Go down and tell everybody there if you want, but I don't think it's the route to solving this personally. What I am saying, though, is that you need to let people know and you need to let the people who are in positions of power, I'm not sure that they are, but and I don't know the degree to which they know what's going on, and some of them won't, and some of them just need to be told with compassion, but you do need to talk to people. So share the information with people. Um, and also, whatever you do, don't sign up for digital ID, okay? If you have a digital ID, then you become a player in their fantasy football league. All the data that they're harvesting about you from the street lights, your online activity, your smart devices, etc., can then be centralized and attributed to person X versus person Y. And there's a whole economy that's going to be based on gambling, on not just what you do or what you might do, but what your children do or what your children might do. So say that the data that they're gathering through all of the apps that they are making our children and parents use in primary schools right now indicates that at age five, your child's reading age is on a par with the reading age of all the other five-year-olds in the area. But for whatever reason, and I don't actually believe in comparing children in this way anyway, but say that for whatever reason, by age seven, your child's reading age is slightly behind that of their peer group. Uh, maybe just because they're too busy learning about more age-appropriate life skills like how to balance on walls and jump over burns. Anyway, for whatever reason, their reading age is not exactly what it should be at age seven. And 
boom, that's digital currency in the bank for the philanthropist who bet on your child being a loser. Okay? So that's why we need to stop this, yeah? Feel really, really passionate about it, I think you can probably see. Um, uh, I know that you know that it's not okay. So for your sake, and for your children's sake, and for your, your grandchildren's sake, and you know, for God's sake, uh, please just say no to digital ID. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, just before I throw it open um, for other people to hopefully share their knowledge, um, I hope you don't mind if I take a moment to thank Cindy Niles and Julianne Romanello for everything that they've taught me and everything that they're teaching others. Please find them on Facebook alongside a community of other wonderful people um, who would love to welcome you and talk with you and listen to you um, so that together we can all grow our wisdom. Thank you, Greg, for doing my leaflets. Thank you, Bronwyn, for reminding me to um, get uh, the contact details for Govan's local councillor. His name's Stephen Dorman, and everybody can take those contact details. There's a wee slip there as they leave the door if you would like to um, have easy access to um, a way to contact somebody straight away when you leave. Um, thank you, Archie, uh, for your Access All Areas laptop and for all your help. Thank you very much. Um, and of course, thank you very much to all of you lovely people for coming. Um, and I really mean that. I love you all. Thank you. Um, thank you.